Hello and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to share some updates to my Kuki antenna setup. Welcome back and thanks for being here. My name is Scott and if you've been following my channel then you know that I've made a lot of updates, enhancements, upgrades, however you want to say it, to my mobile amateur radio station or ham radio as it's often referred. And I'm going to go through my channel and update my videos to reflect my most recent updates and setups. Today I'm going to talk about the antenna setup and this has been my most challenging video to shoot because every time I find a spot the birds start calling traffic goes by and most often people stop and talk to me <laughs> so uh, today it's overcast been raining maybe i can get it done let's see uh let's see the the elephant in the room is of course this big tower here and i'm going to say full disclosure this is an exhibition setup i do not normally drive around and operate with all this equipment on the roof at the same time these antennas do interact with each other so I mount, everything is modularized, and I mount what I need for the mission at hand. So, if I'm doing a VHF contest where the beams are beneficial, then I will put up the beams. And maybe a dual band vertical, no HF or any of that other stuff. And then on the weekends, I like to mount my horizontal loops. Those are for single sideband nets. If I'm working parks on the air, then I will only put up the HF antennas and certainly none of this extra stuff because like I said, these antennas do interact with each other. But this is an exhibition setup right now. I just came back from uh, RARS Fest, the Raleigh Amateur Radio Society's Ham Fest. And so this stuff is still up here and I will take it down soon. So let me give you a walkthrough. So the most uh, noticeable thing on here right off the bat that just about anybody sees, well, now it's the tower, and so that, uh, that, that earns the, the car a lot of photographs. But before the tower, it was my Scorpion mobile HF antenna. And I have a pretty exhaustive video on this antenna that, you know, and I share what it, what it does, what it's for. But this is a mobile HF antenna that tunes from 3.5 to 29 megahertz. And uh, I've got a capacitance hat up here, which makes the antenna electrically longer but physically shorter and that limits me to going as high as 18 megahertz. The difference that you'll see here compared to my other video is this is a black widow so the antenna is finished in it's powder coated in in gloss black and it looks really nice and this antenna tube here this uh this coil cover tube on the black widow is also powder coated black but I got my hands on this uh, this clear one. The standard Scorpion is stainless steel and unfinished and so it's silver and then has this clear tube. So those who have that antenna, this is not a surprise to them. But uh, I decided that for car shows and exhibitions that I wanted to get this clear tube because it shows the inner workings of the antenna and I think this is pretty neat. I might leave this on full time. I don't know. I still have my black tube obviously. So uh, yeah, I'll have to think about that. I have a second HF antenna on the car, and that is this ATAS 120 Alpha. ATAS, ATOS, however you want to say it, it stands for Active Tuning Antenna System. And this is by Yesu, and this is a, a, a screwdriver antenna, as is the Scorpion. They're both screwdriver antennas, and so this sleeve will move up and down to expose, coil, and tune. This antenna will tune from 7 megahertz up to... 54 megahertz and then the whip up there is already pre-tuned to uh, 146 megahertz and 440 megahertz so it's very wide banded but arguably not a great performer that's what a lot of people are going to tell you is oh this is this is not a, a performance antenna it's essentially a dummy load on 40 meters or 7 megahertz and I don't know I've used it and had a lot of success with it I've had this antenna for 15 years I've talked to South America, Europe, uh, not Asia, but my most distant contact was 5,000 miles. And so it works. So why do I have two HF antennas on the car? Well, this Scorpion is really huge. And so I don't always have it on the car, especially if I know I need to get in and out of the trunk a lot. The ATAS stays on the car full time, which makes it very convenient. And tuning it is just a push of the button type of operation. So. Uh, uh, with key Yesu radios. It is literally an easy button, so why would I not want that? 
All right, let's move on to the other antennas. So uh, I have, since I pointed out the A test, I will say that I have an antenna mounted at each corner of the roof rack. So the next antenna that I will point out is this one changes a lot. Right now I have this little 450 megahertz antenna on here and it's very wide banded so I can use it with GMRS, maybe 70 centimeters if I want. It's currently unplugged, but if I wanted to, I could plug it into my DV Mega, which is a private D-Star access point. My DV Mega uses a, it's a Raspberry Pi with a mezzanine board on it. So there's an antenna inside the car and I can walk around outside the car with an HT, a handheld transceiver and access it from well, about a hundred yards, I think. With this exterior antenna, I've never tested it, but I wonder if I could reach it from a half mile away, and that would be a half mile radius. So, so that's a pretty wide area that I could use my DV Mega with this up here. So mounted here in the factory antenna hole is uh, a dual band antenna. I am using, I'm using this electro mag wave mount to adapt uh, an NMO mount into the factory 40 millimeter square hole. Uh, see the video I have on this mount. Uh, I'll link it up here in the corner or something. This antenna is my daily antenna. It's on the car all the time. And what I can do, I, I had mentioned that I use this mount over here for a variety of things. Well, if I put a cargo box on top of the car, I can't mount any antennas up here, but I can take this antenna and move it over to there. And then I would still have my dual band capability with a cargo box mounted. And so that's a nice option that I like to have. Here on this uh, corner here is my WeBoost cellular signal booster. And I forgot to mention, that's what this little antenna here is for. This is the one I was using originally. And when I put the rack on the car and switched to this antenna, I did not remove the smaller antenna, partially because I'm lazy, but also if for some reason I take this roof rack off the car, I want to have the ability to fall back to another antenna. So that's why that is still there. The WeBoost cellular signal system, what it does is it takes in a weak cellular signal on this antenna, takes it into the car where the signal is amplified, and then retransmitted on a smaller antenna that is inside the car. And then likewise, my outgoing cell signal is received by the antenna in the car, put through the amplifier, and then it goes out on this antenna. So that is what this is for. And then up here in the front corner, I have a 900 megahertz antenna. We have a member in the club who he loves to put people on 900 megahertz. 900 megahertz is one of those use it or lose it bands. And so if you don't use the frequencies, then the FCC can take them away. And they have done that, say, on the 222 megahertz band. So use the frequencies or lose them. Now, I have to admit that I don't have a 900 megahertz radio in the car. He gave me one, but I've been so busy with my upgrades that I have not yet connected this to a radio. But it's here. I'm making progress. And so that's, that's where the 900 megahertz antenna lives. All right, let's talk about the modules now. So each of these, I have two modules up here. So uh, this one is a single plank held down by four bolts. This is my horizontal loop module. And so what I have for horizontal loops is I have 50 megahertz up top, 144 megahertz right here. That's this next square down, this uh, square loop, and then 432 megahertz. Let me see if I can move over. There you go, 432 megahertz. And so those are my three contesting bands. And this was my, my original contest setup before I expanded to the beams. But I do still use these horizontal loops because there's a local six meter net every Sunday night and a two meter net every Tuesday, I believe. And then there's a guy who runs uh, nets on Tuesday mornings on two meters as well. So I, I like having the loops available to me. I usually will mount this platform on Saturday and then remove it on Tuesday. So it's not on the car full time. And then the other module is this platform here. So this is three planks and they are fastened together with two, three, three cross members. And it's bolted to the rack with 12 bolts. And by the way, these bolts go to these, uh, they go through these little snap around uh, accessory mounts by Yakima. These are called Mighty Mounts 39H. So that's how they're held to the rack. And so this platform here, it, it holds my 
22 inch tall micro tower, as I call it, which has a Yesu G450 ADC rotator. So yes, this all rotates and the rotator works. You can see I've got it turned right now. And while I'm pointed up there, let me tell you about the antennas. So up at the very top, I have basically duplicated my horizontal loops. So I've got on the horizontal loops, I've got uh, 6, 2, 432. And up here I have 6, 2, 432. And when I say 6, 2, 432, what I'm really, what's really going on here is these antennas are very narrow banded. They are tuned specifically for the single sideband portion of each band. And so it's literally 50 megahertz, 144 megahertz, and 432 megahertz. So it's not the entire six meter band, two meter band, and so on and so forth. So uh, up at the top, this is a, a PAR Electronics stressed Moxon. So some of you have heard of the Moxon design. This is a stressed Moxon. If you look really closely, you can see that this piece here is kind of flexing the place because it's held together by tension. That way, well, I don't think they designed it for hitting trees, but, but mobiles or rovers love them because if you do strike a tree, well, not, not if you do, it's, it's when you do. You will hit a tree eventually with a setup like this. I've hit three or four. So when you hit a tree, uh, if it gets knocked apart, that's okay. You just bring it down, put it back together, put it back up. It's, so far I have not broken anything. So it's a very robust antenna. The Stress Moxon, it's, uh, the Moxon antenna is basically a folded Yagi and that design is known as an Uda Yagi antenna. So it's a two element beam with folded elements. And so you can barely make out the, uh, uh, the insulator here. I don't know if I can point at it, so I'm just gonna blow it up there. And that's what separates this into two halves. And so the front is the active radiating element and the back portion is a, a passive radiator. So two elements, approximately three dBD of gain and a lot of front to back separation. My other antennas, the other beams, they are uh, Rover Specials by Directive Systems and Engineering. And the reason they're called rover specials is because the boom is eight feet long, which means as I boom the antenna around, I can go full broadside with it while I'm driving down the road. And the max width of the vehicle does not exceed eight feet, which is the max allowable width of a vehicle driving down the road. So this is a six element, 144 megahertz beam. I think the gain on it is around 10.5 dBD. And then the 432, is a 15 element Yagi and its gain is 13.5 dBD. So all very effective and, and fantastic in a mobile environment. <laughs> I can, when I switch between the upper and lower stacks, I can hear the difference in gain right away. Even, if, well, what I should say is not the difference in gain, the difference in separation or rejection. So I can hear a whole lot less noise because I'm not listening to everything all around me. I'm hearing only what is in front of that beam and that's really nice. All right, so that's a lot of antennas and therefore a lot of coax. And so for these platforms, these horizontal uh, antennas, right now I have six coax uh, cables coming into the car and I have uh, pass-throughs for eight. So I have room to add the 222 megahertz band when I'm ready. I created this pass-through panel and this is, I forget what kind of plastic this is. I'll, I'll put a note. This is uh, 3 16 of an inch thick, which is the same thickness as the glass. And then I have these 1 8 inch sandwich pieces to help. It doesn't really clamp it to the glass like it looks like it does, but it keeps it from flipping out or in. So it, it holds everything nice and steady. And then these are type N connectors. And so they're waterproof. And uh, I, I could have sure sealed them up with tape and everything, but with as often as I take these off and on, I do not have them waterproofed. They are grouped by, uh, by platform. So uh, this here is for the Yagis and this is for the loops. And I already mentioned that I put them on for, for different occasions. And there's a switch inside the car that allows me to switch between the loops and the beams. Now inside the car, it's a little messy in here, but the, the coax passes through the door or the window, I should say. And then this is, a, this is a factory screen here that I have. And so uh, it's all back here. And then it passes through into the car, very neatly routed. I have them uh, fastened here to the door handle. And then down here is where it looks a little 
It looks a little messy, but uh, this is where the excess is gathered. And I have it bungeed so that when I open and close the door, it gets pulled out of the way. That way it never gets closed on the door. So it's a very uh, tidy for its messiness, if that makes sense. <laughs> so that's how I have that routed into the car. There's one more thing that I haven't discussed yet, and that's a little bit of stabilization here. I mean, it looks like stabilization, but it's really retention. You can see that I have guyed this tower. And so I've seen comments where people say, really, you guide a tower on a car? <laughs> what for? So let me ask you, if you had this tower, this, this overall height of the tower and mast alone is six feet and did not have three antennas on it that we're talking about just the tower if you had this on the roof at your house and knew that it would be subjected to hurricane force winds every day would you guy it or not i think most people would guy it so that's what i've done i guide this setup the idea is it will provide some stability I can hear things flexing around up there as I go through turns and things, or maybe heavy braking and acceleration. But its true purpose, in my mind anyway, is retention. So the rack is very sturdily affixed to the car. It is rated to hold 165 pounds, and that is a dynamic load, which means as the car moves. And so this whole setup here with all these antennas weighs around 100 pounds so that is well within the capacity of the rack except for say some of this top side weight maybe swinging around a little bit that could put extra stressors down here so again the guys are stabilizing this a little bit but if something happens if i hit a a tree limb that i miss especially in the dark or perhaps a large bird i don't know what a large bird impact up there will do as far as excessive forces down here so what kind of impact up there what kind of force will that apply down here i'm not an engineer so i don't know but if i break a bolt down here then my hope is that at least one of these guys will hold on and and keep things from flying through somebody else's vehicle long enough for me to get the whole thing to the side of the road so i'd rather it stay attached to the car and bang up my car than going through somebody else's car and perhaps kill somebody. So this is secondary retention. Stability is a secondary goal. How do I have it affixed? I have these sea sucker mounts. Now let me zoom in there so you can see the, uh, the website. So this is seasucker.com. They got their start in the uh, marine industry. I had incorrectly stated on another channel that, that they got their start in the bicycle mounts and things like that. And that's where I discovered them in the bicycling industry. Each of these suction cups holds 210 pounds. And with the lines pulling at this angle, probably closer to 100, because that's 210 pounds straight up. And then I'm pulling at an angle like this. And so, yes, all very easy to apply. And it's I have it tensioned pretty good. And I can adjust the tension with the uh, turnbuckles at, on each line. Uh, I will show a B-roll of how easy it is to uh, release this suction and then apply these basically I don't want to undo this with the car being wet like it is because I don't want the moisture to get compacted under there when I uh, reapply the suction but basically you just release you just lift up on this and it'll break the suction and then to get it back on what I do is I, I pull some tension into the the line as much as I can get I lay it down but I don't press and then I just start pumping and that pumping action pulls this down just a few millimeters, but that's just enough to apply tension to this line here. And then if I want to add a little more tension, like I said, I just take up that slack with the turnbuckles. And like I said, these work great. Uh, each, again, each one holds, well, let's just say in my application, each one is holding about 100 pounds and I have four. So I have one at each rear corner here. And then you can see uh, the ones here in the front of the rack. So those are slightly hidden, but, but they're there. And all I have to do is make sure that there is no orange showing on these little pumps. So ideally I could get out of the car at rest stops and check, maybe just give it a pump just for giggles, but I have never seen these things give up any suction. I do have these eyes at the driver's side corners 
And so what these eyes are for is when I, when I remove the tower, the, just the base of the tower alone, so the base and the 22 inch micro tower together, because I don't unbolt all of that, those two items alone weigh 50 pounds. The mast with the beams adds another 25. And while I can lift 75 pounds, it's a little unwieldy to deal with. So what I do to bring the tower down or put it up, so I, I remove all the bolts from it, I will take this suction cup and line, I will take it and I will move it to under here. Then I will get bungee cords as backups. And I'm probably gonna make something that's not bungee, but from here to my tie downs up there, each corner, these are secondary for extra safety. And then I'll take the whole tower and tilt it over and the lines hold everything in place so it keeps every, it keeps the tire from falling on the car and then what i do is i release the bolts that hold the mass into place and then i slide the whole mass in assembly out and then i walk off with the antennas put them someplace then i'm able to release my safety lines and then lift the tower off the car and get it down onto some uh, saw horses i usually work from saw horses instead of putting the whole thing down on the ground because uh, uh, picking that up off the ground is a little tougher than picking it up off a sawhorse. All right, there you have it, my antenna farm. <laughs> Again, I don't roll with this stuff on the car all the time, but I figured I would shoot some kooky video that shows everything on the car all at once. Feel free to ask questions. I, I enjoy answering questions. I really got a kick out of being at Hamcation and Rars Fest. I will be at Roanoke, their Ham Fest, as well as... Um, Berryville, both in Virginia. So feel free to come on by. I, I like talking about the setup and the challenges of making it work, all the experimentation that I've done. As always, I appreciate you being here and joining me. I'll see you next time. Take care.